as I said already this morning, it's great to be with you and it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. The title of the message this morning is When My Heart is Overwhelmed. When My Heart is Overwhelmed. I'd like to pose the question to you, have you ever been there when your heart is overwhelmed? I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 61. And I want to read and trust that you'll read along with me verses 1 and 2. I want to jump ahead just a moment as you are turning there. I, for now more than 50 years, uh, have been convinced that the Bible is set apart from every other book in the world. And as much as we can say that maybe the Bible that you were, that you are holding, and whether that's in this literal form or something approximating an iPad or an iPhone that you've downloaded scriptures into. The fact is that this book is set apart from every other book in the world. There is no book in the world that can lay claim to the truth that it is living. Books that we may read from time to time, hoping and probably more so in the heart of the writer, hoping to be captured by the words that are in print, and through those words get a picture of what is in the heart of the one who wrote it, and maybe at least get some enjoyment out of the reading. There's no other book in the world that can lay claim to the fact that it is living. Because we know that the word is not just the printing on the paper. The word is a person. Jesus is the word. In John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word. And the word was God and the word was with God. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is active and sharper, living and powerful active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the only living book. The problem is that many times we can refer to it as just a book. I realize over the past number of months, it has become even more real to me when I find my heart overwhelmed. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1 and 2. As we read more than just looking at the pages on the paper or on our electronic devices, can we for a moment read it as though we were the ones writing it? Because the writer of this psalm is not a fictional character. This psalm is written by David. David who went through many situations in life, not all of which were favorable, and I think if he had the opportunity to do some of those things over again, I pray, would have made different choices. How many would like a second chance in that area? Probably most of us. When we read it as though we are writing it, 
We don't just hear it. We proclaim it. So, put yourself in this place. Hear my cry, O God. You ever said that? Maybe not in those same words. Hear my cry, O God. I want to tell you something this morning. That the Spirit of God broods over His Word. And He prepared this before today for you for today. So whether you were invited by someone else or you made a conscious choice that this is your place of worship and and you came because this is where you find yourself on Sunday mornings or whenever else we meet because this isn't just your home, this is your church. This is where God reveals His plans and purposes. Psalm 77, verse 13. Your way, O Lord, is in your sanctuary. We distance ourselves from that and it becomes confusing about what the way is. It certainly becomes confusing by all the voices that we hear out there as to the problems that we are currently finding ourselves in. There's so much conversation out there, so many voices speaking, that if you followed the voices, you might as well go to Disneyland and get on the merry-go-round, because that's about as much effect that that's going to have on you. Not that you can't be persuaded by those things that you hear, but when you get off, all you are left with is that that was going in a circle. The reality of all that's being proclaimed out there, I was chuckling this morning as I was sitting at my desk, One of the most recent things that seem to be on the minds of so many that lead the administration of our land is the issue of climate change. Is it scientific? Do you believe it? Don't you believe it? I just opened my Bible to Genesis and discover in chapter 3 that that's all about climate change. It isn't original. It's been a problem from the beginning. But the climate has nothing to do with the rising seas, or so they say. It's the fall that has introduced a climate that is not part of God's intention. How do we get back to where we are supposed to be? We have to be honest. How many love honesty? Thank you, church. How many love honesty when it hurts? Not so many hands going up. Anybody ever sat with you and say, I want to be honest with you for a moment? Well, especially as a pastor, I don't always enjoy those moments because usually it might include something that I've done wrong, which I'm not afraid of admitting. Hear my cry, O God. Not a very developed prayer, is it? Not very extensive. Doesn't include all of the circumstances of life, but someone just standing in a situation only armed with this. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. How many have felt at times you prayed and nobody was listening? Pastor, you can't feel that way. You're the pastor. What hope do we have? Well, before I was a pastor, I was a me. And just like you, I put my pants on one leg at a time. 
attend to my prayer. Do you know what attend means? I'm going to jump ahead in my story for just a moment. On June 25th, when Pastor Vivian went into surgery, a lot of interesting things were going on inside of me, and even though there were a number of people with us in the waiting room, family and friends, and I was trying to be, as it were, the gracious host, so to speak. And I was glad that some were having a good time. And, but inside, my heart was silent. Because all I could say is, God, attend to my prayer. And I thought for a moment, does that mean he is required to answer my prayer the way that I want him to? Is he obligated to meet your every want? Does he have to do everything we ask him to do? At that moment, if someone would have asked, and several said, how are you doing? And I appreciated the concern, but, but I couldn't let the words out of my mouth. My heart is overwhelmed. Because I want him to attend to my prayer, but, but I don't know exactly what, what the attendance means. Will he do what I would ask him to do? I think you know what that is. And I was silent inside. Attend to my prayer. I said, Lord, I I can read those words, but but you said your word is living. I don't want to just read it. I want to receive it. Knowing that you attend to my prayer. And so Lord, how can I be a manifestation of that? And he said to me, attend to her. I said, but I'm not in the surgery. He said, yes, you are. For you're one. You're in there. Attend to her. We went through the surgery. She came out. Except for two times in five days when I couldn't stand myself. And I'm sure that the staff appreciated that I took a moment out to go home and shower I never left her side. I slept there for five days. I'm not asking for a hand clap and say, oh, what a great spiritual man or wonderful husband. But I said, Lord, my, my heart is overwhelmed. I want to be a manifestation of you. Little did I realize that that very prayer or statement was echoing the very essence of something that had been prophesied over my life many, many years ago by a man who many of you may know, Brother Moore, C.L. Moore, a prophet of God. When in one of those moments of intense visitation and focus, he walked up to me and he said, Son, Son, you've been called to this area to suffer, 
and suffer you shall, that the Christ may come forth in you. It's one of those words you received that was not followed by a tremendous hand clap from me, although I said thank you. Little did I realize that it would take years to develop. You see, only what's done for Christ will last. All other things will soon be past. So when I said, Lord, my heart is overwhelmed, attend to my prayer, I didn't just want him supervising my prayer, telling me what to pray. I just wanted him to hear me. But I said, but whatever you want, I'm good with it. Because I have no requirements on you. You know my desires. But it says if you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. And and I found myself in that dilemma. You know the dilemma. Why would you delight yourself in the Lord if it's not going the way that you think it ought? What ought to go? What delight is in that? From the end of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me. How many times has someone come alongside of you when it's obvious that you're not going the right direction? comes alongside of you and tries to take your arm. Here, let let me help you. You ever done that? Someone comes alongside and wants to help you and, and you pull your arm away. I got this. I, I can do this. And then you realize when they walk away, stupid didn't walk away, stupid still standing there. One of the most difficult things in my life that I had to learn was that I didn't know it all. When I was a teenager, I believed that I did. And as I grew out of that, and hopefully I have, I realized I don't know everything. Then I come to the realization that even now there are times when I have to ask for someone else to lead me. Silent in here. Hopefully because you are identifying with me. It says, lead me to the rock. Isn't that what we heard from Pastor Vivian this morning? Isn't that what we heard all during worship? Take me to another place. Well, I realize that there's a manifold benefit to getting to a higher place. Because when I was sitting in the waiting room, waiting for the doctor's report, I wasn't in a higher place. I was in the place of realizing that I couldn't wake up from this. And as much as I had my prayers... As much as I believe that I knew the heart of God in the matter, I was still vulnerable. Because it is only He who has the final word. 
And I had to wait. One of the most th- one of the most favorite things that Americans love to do. Wait. But then there are some benefits to that as well, which I'll touch on in a few moments. Are you praying this with me for just a moment? Are you making these declarations with me for just a moment? When? You know, it doesn't say if my heart is overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me. You know what lead me means? It means you have to extend your hand. You have to make a conscious decision to take hold of something or someone. If I say to Pastor Bob, Bob, lead me. And he goes, okay, give me your hands. I'm, no, I'm not giving you my hand. You just start going and I'll follow. The problem is with that is that there's deception in between he and I. What's the deception? The deception is that when I think he's going the wrong way, I have the right to choose to not follow any longer. Because why? There's no connection. He's walking, I'm walking. When the walk doesn't seem to line up, see you later, Bob. I'm going my own way. When you ask somebody to lead you, you take their hand and you don't let go until you arrive at your destination. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I realize when you are taken to a higher place, that's the implication here. You see things differently. If there's anything wrong in our world is that people have lost their way. They've lost their vision. So many times people equate vision with their goals. When I reach the goal in my life, I reach my vision or my vision is fulfilled. Let me tell you, your vision will fall prey to infection at the very least. If you realize, or I should say don't realize, then unless you get to a higher place, you're going to lead yourself and don't let anybody else talk you out of it. That vision, listen to me, vision is a matter of perspective influenced by two things. By attitude and altitude. How many have ever flown in an airplane? Most everyone, I think. Do you realize there's a reason why they call it an aeroplane? It is not an automobile. Because an aeroplane is designed to fly in the air. How many know it would be very difficult to get from here to New York if the airplane never gets off the ground? Right? Pastor, you're profound. Vision is affected or influenced by attitude and altitude. I realized at that vulnerable moment, I could not see what I needed to see. Me to experience if I stayed where I was. 
Where was I? What's the title of the message today? When you stay in the place where your heart is overwhelmed, you will never get above what you can see on your own. To back up just for a moment, I kept feeling like God was saying that we're moving into a new season of our life. Time of change. We've seen some of those changes in the natural. I may not be preaching as much as I once did. Other things have changed. Necessary change. We need to pass what we have on to another generation. That means change. But I had no idea what this change or season of life would encompass. On May 17th, Vivian and I had an appointment for her to have an ECG. At the end of the test, the technician said very clearly, echo, yeah, echocardiogram. She needs to see the doctor. She needs to see the doctor now. We said, okay, well, we'll schedule it in a few weeks. She said, you didn't hear what I said. I'm going out there right now to tell the staff she has to see the doctor right now. Well, why? Why can't tell you? So she marches out. She says some words. We go up, ready to encounter the fact that we're not in the schedule for the next couple weeks. Doctors are busy. To find as we walked up to the counter, as much as there was a slight bit of resistance, the lady said, okay, we can have an appointment for you next Friday. The doctor's office to her cardiologist. He has the test from that previous Friday and the test that he had from before. And he walks in with a little bounce in his step and he announces, this is really good news. We kind of felt a little relieved. And then he said, oops, I made a mistake. First words out of his mouth were, the results of this test means that the problem that you had is not what it was. In fact, it's better than it was. But following the oops was, oh, it's twice as bad as it was. Followed by these words, we need to do something within the next couple of weeks. Because a person in your condition, one of three things can happen. Heart attack, stroke, or sudden death. Thanks. Something needs to happen in the next two weeks. Well, the following week, an angiogram was scheduled. This was the result of the angiogram. Three blockages, faulty aortic valve. My heart was overwhelmed. Inside, not necessarily being vocalized, what happened? We prayed, others praying all over the world, praying and believing for a miracle. Lord, how is that attending to my prayer? 
In our minds, we hear these words as Pastor Vivian talked about fear. Fear says to us, if this doesn't happen within the next two weeks, you'll have a stroke, heart attack, or sudden death. We didn't hold up a cross to the doctor's words. We just realized we were in a different place. The two weeks came, no surgery. Now we're living in that place of the W word. I may remember the W word. Wait. Turn to your neighbor and say, I I love to wait. And then tell them I lied. We went home after the angiogram to wait. We quickly realized in those waiting moments, we had a number of old acquaintances knocking at our door. Fear, doubt, uncertainty. We had to grab ourselves, literally. What we had to realize, and if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. This will help you in your freedom. Waiting is not about time. Waiting is about trust. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Is anybody else awake? Could you maybe give a little stronger amen to that? Waiting is not about time. It's about trust. And then I read again Isaiah 40, 31. When was the last time you read it? Maybe just a moment ago. There it is. Remember we started with Psalm 61 and verse 2. Well, 1 and 2. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. And then I realized that the rock is not just symbolic, it is a person. But I also realized in the symbolism of it, it means to go to a higher place. And, and then all of a sudden when I read Isaiah 40, 31, I, I realized there it is, a higher place. They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. What shall they do? They shall mount up with wings like eagles. You know, eagles go places that chickens can never go. And eagles know how to find the wind currents to get to those levels, they don't just flap harder than chickens. And they have eyesight better than our satellites out in space. And God says, God says, not technology, God says, that I will cause you to rise up like eagles. And you'll be able to see things that you could never see before. But you can rise up even with your heart overwhelmed. Because it is not you who is lifting himself to that place.
as we waited, I realized something's happening here. Two weeks, no surgery. Then I'm reminded Psalm 20 and verse 7. Some trust in chariots and horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. I didn't write it, He did. Of myself. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, not condemning or condescending. Brother, you may trust in chariots, but me. No, but from a place of humility, Lord, that may be their level of trust, but I've chosen to trust in you. So when I ask you to attend to my prayer, I don't have a clue as to what I'm asking. But I know this. You are a good, good father. And you won't allow us to encounter anything that you hadn't already spoken to us about. Again, our hearts overwhelmed. Where do we go? What do we do? Where is our peace? How many times have we said, if I can only be in a different place, my peace will return. If I can only get away from California, I won't have, I won't be subject to earthquakes anymore and Then you move to the middle of Almogordo, New Mexico, and a plane falls out of the sky and crushes your house. You probably would like to be back in the land of earthquakes. Take that in the right way. Peace is not in your circumstance. It's in a person. See, Everything that I've said is right here for you. It's not for me to preach. It's for me to walk. It's for me to decide. I'm going to be led or I'm going to find my own way. And if I find my own way, whatever destination I receive, I I reach... I can't blame it on God for getting me there. I did it my way. Sorry, Frank, if I didn't do the song justice. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. He's the Prince of Peace. John 14, 27. Peace I leave you. Peace I give you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid in my Father's house. Proverbs 4.23 Guard your heart or keep it with all diligence. For out of it flow the issues of life. But, but Dad, my heart is overwhelmed. June 25th, the day of the surgery. For the first time in 53 years, I had to put my wife's heart on 
the hands of someone else. For 53 years, I've held her heart. And I, I had to put it in somebody else's hand. I hadn't been fasting, although people around the world were. I hadn't been praying long prayers deep into the night hours. All I could pray is, Lord, attend to my prayers. All I could pray was this prayer. Be gentle. I don't know if you know it, but biologically, hearts don't like to be messed with. How many have guarded your heart yourself trying to keep it from being messed with? Don't show your hands. We don't want that to go out to a larger crowd that might be watching this morning. But I pray if you are watching and you're in a place where you feel like your heart has been overwhelmed you don't know what to do with it. You got to go to a higher place. You got to go to a rock that doesn't move. You got to find a peace that passes all understanding. And even when you don't know what you're feeling, and all you can say is, My heart is overwhelmed, it's not a testimony of the fact that you've given up. It's a testimony that you are realigning yourself. I think we heard that this morning. Pastor Vivian says you got to reposition yourself. I found my heart praying, Lord, we've never been here before. Be our strong tower because we have no strength now. Be our strong tower. Where do we go? One thing I could clearly recognize with this, this was a new season that we were moving into. Circumstances beyond our control. Our schedules had to change. I just want to say thank you for suffering along with us and the graciousness that you showed us giving us space and time where we weren't able to attend to your needs as maybe we once have. We were allowing people to attend to ours. And I said, Lord, what what does this new season represent? What do we choose now? I just have a couple of notes on here, which is easier. I'll make this available if you want it. What do we choose now? And this is what he put in my heart. Choosing to walk with Jesus through the seasons of our life results in a seasoning that God will use to flavor others' lives. And the beat, and I put in parentheses, heart of God goes on. I think it's interesting since her heart was being operated on. I'm not a surgeon. I know a little bit about things. 
I know that at one point her heart was stopped and a mechanical device was helping her system stay alive while her heart was stopped so they could repair it. But he said, the beat goes on. See, man will try to tell you he can imitate God. He can give you what you need to cause your heart to beat. And you don't need God. But God is the author of life. He's the one who decides. No machine does. As much as my heart was overwhelmed, I had this inner peace knowing I wasn't in the surgeon's hands and neither was she. Because he said, and the beat goes on. The beat goes on people being affected by his presence because we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I saw every day the treasure that was in her come alive. When someone walked in the room, I saw her reach out and touch when she was the patient the attendants became her patients and she ministered life this ought to be our testimony we should get rid of the song nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Choosing to walk with Jesus through the seasons of our lives revolt results in a seasoning that God will use to flavor others' lives. How many times have you gone through something and the only thing you come out with is bitterness and resentment and anger? And every time somebody comes close to you, that's all they're exposed to. And you wonder why nobody wants to be around you. God, why have you done this to me? Nobody wants to be my friend. But you don't understand what I've gone through. And... The world has tried to encourage us by saying, if you get lemons in your life, do what? Make lemonade. I I don't know that I totally subscribe to whatever that means, but I kind of get the gist of it. But, But I realized, see, when we started the church in 1977, how many know that was a few weeks ago? Or it seems like it now, the older we're getting, years pass like weeks. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, don't remember the former things. It goes on, but in those verses, and behold, I'll do a new thing. He was doing a new thing, and I didn't have any frame of reference for it. I need to finish, oh yeah. I'm sitting there in the CCU focusing on the monitors. I can read them. Realizing some of what I was seeing wasn't all that I had hoped to see. At one point she went into AFib. And if you know anything about AFib, you have a 
fairly irregular heartbeat. And it was fairly irregular. And I said, Lord, is this the new season? He said, I'm not finished yet. As I watched those things take place, and one point I asked one of the doctors that came in, so, so is this what we're supposed to be focusing on? And they said, no, that's what it says, but that's not the end. That's not the end. Well, wait. Uh, I, I, I get that word out of your vocabulary. I want to get her out of here. I want. I wanted to go now. I said we just gotta wait. And then after some hours, her heart reset, and AFib went away. And I'm sitting there, saying, Lord. My heart is overwhelmed. But I discovered that something went on in my heart. And it was something that they said. They said these words, you you know the heart has just been through a traumatic experience. I could see that. And then they said these words, What you're seeing on the screen is the heart's attempt is to reboot itself. Wait a minute, I thought the techies came up with that. Reboot. No. God designed your heart to reboot and then they said, because I said, look, look, look at her heart rate. It's supposed to be up around 80. And now it's 37, it's 40. They said, don't worry. It's just rebooting. I said, well, what's going to be the norm? I said, well, the heart now has to readjust to all of this new blood flow. It's not negative, it's positive. How many times we can see something and think that we understand what it is that we're seeing, but until we get the fill-in, the background to what it actually means, we can get disturbed by what it is that we're seeing and our trust starts flying out the window because we think that we know what we're seeing. But there's only one clear lens that you can look through that will always tell you the truth and always give you the clear picture. It's the Word of God. It tells you how to walk. It tells you how to have a right attitude. It tells you what altitude you can choose to fly at. It tells you what the end is no matter what it is you're experiencing in between, it will tell you all you need to know. Because it's living. It's living. I know this isn't your story. Maybe you had circumstances and situations in your life that didn't turn out like that and and you're still living in that place of pain but the provision of God's word is no less available to you than it was available to me in those moments because at the same time I was giving her heart not in ownership but in something that needed to be corrected into someone else's hands. At the same time, I was having to give my hand back 
my heart, I should say, my heart back to God and say, God, if there's anything wrong in my heart, would you please do whatever correction needs to take place? Because when she comes out, I want her not just to see me. I want her to see something different. And I want her to know that it was a choice I made not to leave her side. And I realized in the climate of that, what I had said. I can never promise her that I'll never leave her nor forsake her, but I can remind her of what he said when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh yeah, Pastor, you said your heart was overwhelmed in a new way. It was. That it was. Now my heart was overwhelmed by gratitude, by thankfulness. God, through the course of my entire life, even when I was not following you, you had your eye upon me. Even when I said that church is nothing more than a religion and I don't need a crutch. When I realized that what I'd been missing is not filling my Sundays with going to church, what I had missed was the relationship. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Make me what you want me to be. Most of us like a laboratory version where all the conditions are controlled no pain no problems Lord I'm willing to submit myself to the process Gabby for two weeks after that if you don't come through I'm out and he reminded me can we put the word for the year back up, Joe, and I'll finish. I'm way over my time. Maybe I need to preach more often so I don't use it up all in one time. I'm just kidding. I told you before, when God gave this word to me, I didn't realize the implications of what this would be to me personally. We, we all love the depiction, don't we? The, the waves, the waters parting. Glorious scene, isn't it? We all clap. Wow, tremendous. God, you really did something. Amen. No argument. But, but that wasn't where Moses started. He started allowing himself to be put in the hands of someone who put him in a little basket and floated him down the river. The way we interpret that now is I've been sold down the river, but well, it might be close. Someone else led him. But God never left him. And every one of those unfortunate things in his life was God using it to develop a seasoning through the seasons in his life that he could use Ryan to flavor Well, Pastor, I haven't been to the places you've been. I've not touched the people that you've touched. You know, with God, you may get disturbed by this, but with God, it's never been about numbers. That's churchianity. It's never been about numbers. It's been about following. And all he needs is one. 
just one. So many times I've stood like Moses and people might clap and say, look at all that has been accomplished and, and all I can think about is I think he stood there saying, my heart is overwhelmed. Because what he has in his memory that maybe not everybody saw, all they saw in Moses' back were his flaws. Oh, pastor's losing it now. But what he saw in front of him was Jesus. And when he stood in that place, it wasn't about parting the waters. It was about trusting God that no matter what was in front of them, the God that had brought them this far was the same God that would take them through. So when he raised his staff, when he raised his staff, it wasn't an act of frustration. It was a symbol of obedience because God had already said, Go to the edge of the water and raise your staff. I've never done this before. Didn't ask you that. I'm not asking you to weigh in on this. I'm just asking you to be obedient. But my heart is overwhelmed. I will lead you to a rock that is higher than you. There's a lady right behind Jim, black hair. Have your hair kind of done around your face. Would you stand up, please? Yes, you right there. Karen, would you tap her, please? Thank you. Would you just stand up for a minute? This is not to embarrass you. You've been a lot of rocky places. You heard the message this morning. There have been seasons in your life when your heart was so overwhelmed that voices came to you and said, there's no point in trying to continue this life because there's not going to be any fruit in it. Look at what's already happened. But I want to tell you this morning, God brought you here to tell you that the past is not going to determine your future. If you will trust Him, if you will give Him your whole heart, He won't abuse it. No matter how many instances in life that have been abusive, He won't abuse it. And He's going to show you pictures of the possibilities for your life, you'll say, how did I not see that before? But it's going to be amazing. It's not going to be a wild ride. It's going to be a wonderful life. If you just say, Lord, I can't trust what I feel anymore. I just need to give my heart to you. Give him permission to reboot it. And you'll be good to go. Let's, let's stand. Thank you for your patience this morning. Oh, I don't know if you feel better. I sure do. Uh, let's, let's just take ourselves and I'm not I, I want to be careful. I'm not talking about some out-of-body experience. But if we could just say for a moment, self, 
God wants to lead you to a place higher than you. For goodness sakes, take his hand and let him do it. We didn't pray for hours. There's times for that. But in the vulnerable moments of where you stand today, may very well be the moments that will decide where you go from here. But if you let him lead you, he'll lead you to a rock that is higher than you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. If you need prayer, please feel free to come up. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. God bless you as you go. Encourage one another. Hug one another. Is there anything I forgot? Okay. God bless you. Good to see you.